Welcome to today's panel discussion on coatings and uh, applications in curing systems. Coatings are in increasingly being used in a range of protective applications, uh, such as automotive and harsh environments. They're also used uh, to waterproof cell phones and uh, handheld devices, and they're used to coat LEDs. This panel is here to discuss some of the trends and material uh, coating systems and the curing in applications. I'm joined by uh, a distinguished panel. From my left, we have Hans Bok from uh, Specialty Coatings uh, Systems. Welcome, Hans. Uh, to his left, we have Camille Seibert from Nordson Asentech. To my immediate right, we have Jeff Sargent from Humaseal. Uh, and to my extreme right, we have Dave Edwards from Henkel. Uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so um, my very first question, which is, uh, and I'll put it, I think, to start with, with Hans. Uh, what are the key parameters when considering a coding system? Well, one of the most important uh, things that we look at when we talk to customers about coding uh, the type of material they're using. Uh, usually when they come to us, they already have pre-selected the material um, because of uh, their applications, they've already done extensive testing. So we have uh, very little input into that uh, most of the time. Um, also their board configuration is very critical. Um, the kind of, that would help us develop the um, uh, tool set required to go and, and apply the coatings. Uh, some, in some cases, they would need to do um, uh, dispensing as well as conformal coding so it's a r really it's a combination of all those things right okay so, so camille yeah um if i may jump in yep. on that um from the equipment side as han was saying a lot of the applicator selection that you go with is determined by the materials that you choose so different applicator technologies um, are available depending on the type of material range that you're going for so a right. lot of acrylics lend themselves to film coating processes um, a lot of your urethanes and your silicones lend themselves more to your atomized spray type processes. Yep. And then depending on the board layout and the board geometry you have, you may have other requirements depending on accessibility, what applicators are going to get you close to components, what applicators are you going to give you the selectivity that you need right. for your processes. Okay. And I think you've got a, a couple of examples um, from uh, Nordstrom Asim Tech there. So uh, this is an example of an atomized spray process. So mm -hmm. normally it does well with higher viscosity materials. So your urethanes, your silicones, mm -hmm. it tends to put down a wider pass um, and then yeah you get varying degrees of, of selectivity. So it's a good broad pass applicator, and then selectivity can either be enough for a customer or it may be better off paired with another applicator for mm. more precise it control. Yeah, it didn't look like a very tight line definition on it uh, there, uh, or, was that, or was I just looking at a, a large uh, magnified version? A little bit of both. So yeah. you're right, in general, spray process are processes are not as precise as mm. non-atomized processes. Right. So you're taking the material, you're applying some kind of energy to the fluid and it basically disperses it into a mist and you're trying to control where that mist goes. And there are varying technologies out there and different degrees of spray coating, some of which give you more of a gradual edge than others. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times a lot of that comes down to what the customer specifically is requiring for their application, how selective do they need to be, and then whether that applicator is best paired with like a needle applicator or a jet applicator to make sure that you have that precise control where you need it. Absolutely, okay. Jeff, um, what are your uh, parameters for um, uh, when somebody's looking for a coating system? Well, I mean, for, for our, as a material supplier, we, you know, the, you know, Hans mentioned that a lot of times the customer already has a material in mind. Uh, in many cases, the, you know, the opposite situation occurs as well. Someone has an existing material set, whether it's, you know, SCS or a Simtech or some other platform. Mm -hmm. uh, they have, they had been using it for a certain material. They've decided to make a switch and, you know, you walk in and they have a certain material set and they want your fluid to work with that material set as well. Right. But as far as when we're working with a new customer to select the material. From the coding vendor standpoint, our biggest question is, what are you trying to protect from? Mm -hmm. Do you need to protect from humidity, uh, you know, corrosive gases, you know, mm -hmm. what's your temperature uh, range of operation for your device once it's fielded? So we're really, from a material standpoint, we start off asking the customer, you know, what is your device doing and what are you trying to protect it from? 
right. that that guides our material choice, and then you know that gets into the fluid we'll select, and that viscosity you know may drive the uh, you know equipment selection. Right. Ideally, you know we've had situations where you know us as a material vendor and the equipment people are coming to the customer for the project at the same time. And that's an ideal situation because we can work together to provide a mutual material set that yeah, works. I'm sure most, most cases people have already got the equipment, it's just uh, that they're wanting to try and make your, your material work with the equipment. In many cases, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then in, there's other cases where a customer has grown from you know, more simple application processes and their, their mm -hmm. production volume has grown where an automated system makes sense. Yeah. And they're entering that and they're looking for the material that they may have been using from their supplier, uh, you know, for hand spraying or for a brush process, they want to automate now. So yeah. it's, it's similar, but it brings up a new set of engineering and process challenges that for us and for the, you know, the equipment person who's stepping in. Right, right. Dave, I'm sure you have uh, much of the same uh, challenges. Um, uh, does it, depending on the application, do you recommend whether they should uh, they should clean before they actually use your coatings, uh, or, or uh, uh, how do you approach it? Yeah, I mean it all depends on the application. Again, like it's mentioned before, uh, what are they trying to protect uh, against? Uh, what's 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 their end use? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, what kind of parameters do they need uh, for their end product, uh, and what type of limitations do they have for processing? Do they already have established equipment, or can do they want looking for new equipment? What kind of throughput do they need? Uh, you know, do they need something that's really high, uh, you know, high throughput, or is it a, is it a, a you know, like a, a very mm -hmm. low low volume application? Um, so it really depends on again what their application is, uh, and then we start with re first recommending the material, and then we after they, we get a, a material recommendation, there's certain techniques, application techniques that will lend themselves to those types of materials. Okay. So this this is a controller board for a, a car radio, and this is you can see it's it's been selectively coated. So this was done with an automated system, on uh, which you can selectively coat certain areas of the board. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to you know flood the whole whole board with the, with the material. So now you can selectively choose uh, different areas on the board to to coat. Right. Excellent. Okay. So we'll move on to my my second question today, which is uh, when would you use acrylic coatings versus uh, silicon? Acrylic coatings are, are really nice in that most of them are solvent-based systems, so they, there's no really any curing process to them. They're just a simple evaporation of, of solvent, so they can be very processed very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, they provide a very hard coating, a very abrasive-resistant coating, uh, good, good moisture-resistance coating. Uh, but they do have limitations in that the, uh, they don't have very good solvent resistance because they're just basically a polymer that's dissolved into a solvent. Um, and also they, they're, they're temperature limit, limitations. Uh, so in those cases, you'd go with a silicone system. Silicone systems are, are, are very nice in high reliability, high temperature applications. Those temperatures that have really high temperature extremes, either low temperature or high temperature. Um, right. And so they're very low stress, and then they, they, can, they can endure the, the, the temperature extremes uh, without cracking or, or degrading. Okay. So, uh, Jeff, you would agree with that under yeah, the hood applications, I mean, I, things like that? Yeah, to, to kind of piggyback onto what was already been said, I think the main differentiator between someone selecting an acrylic versus a silicone would be the, uh, the temperature profile that the device is going to need. Typically, silicones can tolerate operating temperatures up to 200 centigrade, whereas acrylics are more towards... I don't know, say nominally 125 centigrade. Right. So that that's a big consideration. And then uh, the other consideration would be uh, for certain fielded applications where the coated device may be subjected to periodic condensate, you know, liquid water droplets periodically, silicone mm -hmm. is really great for that as well. Right. Because it, you know, it, it has a, you know, very low surface energy cured and it sheds liquid water droplets very Easily, well. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Anybody think, anything to add to that? Yeah, I'd like to add that um, uh, w when you're selecting materials, the, um, uh, let's say in the case of silicones, they have uh, various properties to them. So from an equipment standpoint, it's very important to uh, understand which materials the customer is using. Some are very quick cure materials. Mm -hmm. um, some are, um, so you want to keep them away from uh, ambient air, moisture, that sort of thing. And some are a little easier to work with than others. But um, that, again, determines what the configuration is for the equipment uh, to best suit the so customer's needs. You, you might have a different valve configuration. Uh, might uh, have a different valve configuration, yeah. the way we handle the materials. Yeah. Um, so all those things uh, play into what will work best for a customer in the long run. 
And then just to round that out a little bit, some customers already have existing equipment, so they may try and find a material mm -hmm. that meets the end result that they're looking for, but is still comparable with the equipment that they already have existing. Right. So, for example, equipment that have been used for silicones can't really be used for other types of materials. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, they may try and stay more with the silicone. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move on to question three is which, what challenges are presented with a waterproof coating? And this time, we'll start with Hans. Yeah, we have one coating. Um, I don't know if they're going to bring that up, but we do have a coating called Perlene, yep. uh, which is actually a, a little different uh, uh, type of application technique from that. It's a vapor deposition material, mm -hmm. uh, but it totally encapsulates everything. So the, the, the real benefit to that is that you totally cover everything. It's got a very low it, permeability. It envelopes the board, basically. Exactly. And it's yeah. got very low permeability, so mm. um, in, in that sense, it, it actually does a very good job with it. Okay. Um, from, from an equipment standpoint uh, of liquid coatings, um, you, you want to take a look at um, uh, having the ability to tilt uh, and get underneath the round components if you need to do that to uh, provide the best coverage that you can mm -hmm. uh, for the application. Okay. Yeah. So if, if we look at the different devices that are starting to get waterproof coating, especially a lot of the handheld devices, yeah. uh, those boards are increasingly complex, complex increasingly sophisticated, um, and so it's really starting to push the technology as far as selectivity, um, thickness, and making sure that you still get appropriate coverage and maintain keep out zones in, in very densely populated boards where your keep out zone is in some cases, maybe even less than a millimeter away from your populated component. Wow. And that is a challenge. That is a challenge. That is a challenge <laughs> to cope. <laughs> okay. So um, definitely some challenges with miniaturization there. Um, yeah. what, what are your thoughts on this, uh, Jeff? Well, I, I mean, f when you're talking about higher levels of waterproofing, it really comes down to material selection. Different polymers have different resistance to humidity and liquid water. So if you really need uh, the highest level of waterproofing, uh, then you know you have to select the proper material, whether that's perylene or some other type of synthetic polymer that has very low, you know, moisture vapor permeability. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, any coating, regardless of of its uh, chemical nature, it's not going to protect if it's not where it's supposed to be. So that's where things like uh, application accuracy and complete coverage and having having an equipment set that can uh, articulate enough so that you can apply the liquid material wherever you need it. That's where that becomes very important to the success of the coating system. Right. Yeah. Um, Dave, I mean, complete coverage is obviously key here for, for waterproofing uh, and it has to, it really has to envelope the board in many ways because it, if, it, if it just goes to the edges, then that's, that, that could be an issue. Uh, what are your views on waterproofing? I know the latest trends with, with waterproofing, as mentioned, was the handheld devices. They're trying to waterproof handheld devices. And because of their size, they have very limited space as far as thicknesses are concerned. So a lot of the, the, the liquid systems now, you know, they're, they're, they're for the requirements for a lot of handheld devices, the thicknesses you, you need for those liquid systems um, is, is too thick. Yep. They're, they're talking, you know, five to 10 micron thick coatings in which most traditional con liquid conformal coatings, uh, you know, need to be at least 20, 30, 30 microns. Uh, and when you're getting that thin of a coating, uh, edge coverage is, is very much a concern. So, um, you know, if you can coat just fine on, on a planar surface, but at the edges, uh, you have little or no coverage. So you're not actually, actually not really waterproofing the device because the edges are still exposed. So that's a, that's a big concern. So that's why there's a lot of trends now going to these nano coatings and ultra thin coatings. Um, and, and doing more of a hydrophobic type coating, which repels the water and doesn't necessarily seal the, the, uh, the, uh, the electronics. Um, but the drawback with the hydrophobic coatings is they don't really give any mechanical protection or any electrical isolation. They just give uh, you know, the, the water protection. Water so protection. you kind of have to, the, the key is to find a material that you can apply very thin that will give you the, the, the waterproofing, but also the electrical insulation that you need. Okay, good. So, uh, moving on to my next question, I'll start with you, Camille, because it's uh, uh, more related to equipment in some ways, but um, are two-part chemistries more effective? Uh, if so, why? I know you've been doing a lot of two-part uh, materials. Right. So, um, obviously, the industry moves and migrates and things evolve, technology evolves and fluids evolve. Um, so, we're seeing a lot 
uh, starting with two component materials. So it really helps you enhance the chemical properties that you really have. And you have the ability of, of enhancing those properties by keeping those two components separated. So it allows our fluid manufacturer friends to really put in what it is that they need to in a way that still makes the process manufacturable. Right. So a lot of times with one component coatings, you're dealing with pot life, um, different environments where it might cure. Mm -hmm. But with the two component coatings, um, you're really able to reduce those risks and really focus more on the chemical properties that you're putting into your fluids. Mm -hmm. And then once your, your material is actually dispensed on the board and it goes into curing, um, you're able to ensure that your fluid is actually cured better because you're not blocked from shadowing for UV cure processes um, or moisture cure processes or anything like that. It's more of a chemical reaction that's going to be going on within the fluid regardless of where the fluid actually right. is. Right. But, but by using the two-part process, so you have no opportunity for the uh, for a chemical reaction uh, before it's applied. It's at the last minute, really, and then, then you can cure. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any input on that, Hans? Yeah, two-part materials um, have, have another consideration. You have um, the life of the material once mixed, so uh, from the equipment side, you just have to be aware of what, what you need to do uh, to, to make sure that the material doesn't harden in the valves, yep. uh, things of that sort. Um, but yeah, once you, once you do get put it down, uh, as Camille said, it does ensure that you're going to get complete you curing. You get a better quality of bond and, and uh, adhesion. Right. Yeah. And again, it, it all goes back to uh, you know the customer working with the coating manufacturers to understand what, what they're trying to achieve with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jeff, any input on that? Yeah, I mean, to round it out from the material side, uh, you know, the big advantage from from our standpoint with a two-part material is, you know, as was already alluded to, you can kind of tailor the reactivity of the two components and combine them, you know, just prior to application or in some cases, some equipment sets right at the point of application. Right. So we can get a more, um, we can get a more complete uh, chemical cure and enhance the properties of the material because we're keeping the two reactive parts of the system separate until the last possible second. Right. So um, it gives you a lot more latitude from the formulation standpoint. Uh, creates some challenges from the equipment standpoint, but with you know some of the recent advances in technology that people like SCS and others have been working on, it's just we have a uh, the equipment is much more capable to handle these two-part materials than we could in the past. Right. So it uh, and as a result of those combined things, I think customers are more willing to look at them when they're selecting a new material yeah. because it opens up some other performance levels that we couldn't have gotten previously. Previously, okay. Dave, do you have anything to add on the two-part material? Well, they, they basically, it's, most of it's been covered. I mean, covered. The main advantage of two-part systems is the stability of room temperature, because now that you've kept, them, kept the, the two reactive components separate, now you can store them at room temperature. You yep. don't need a refrigerator. You don't need a freezer. You don't have downtime to, to bring materials up to room temperature that have been, uh, that have been stored frozen. Uh, also, in some, a lot of times, you can... You can Mix and match because it's a two system, two part system. So you can alter the the, the the resin and the hardener to get different properties. So yeah, you can actually have one. You can actually use one resin and a couple of different hardeners to get different properties that you yeah. need. Yeah. So that storage storage is a very good issue. I mean, it, it, it's and much easier one, to store. One last thing I'd like to add um, with your two part components. Once you mix, you can still apply them the same way that you can your your one part. So mm -hmm. you can still film coat. You can still spray needle jetting application. Right. Right, exactly. Okay, right. Move, we're going to move on to what's going to be our last question because we're running out of time here today, and uh, I'm going to combine it. It's uh, the challenge is connected with um, uh, LEDs um, and with coating LEDs, but I also want to look at uh, UV exposure uh, and the length of the UV exposure. How important is that? Uh, let's start with Hans. Yeah, the uh, applications for the um, uh, LEDs is is uh, somewhat customer driven. Uh, there are customers that have come to us that have no issues with coating over the domes of the LEDs and there are other customers that say no absolutely you cannot coat over the domes which presents another level of challenge uh, because you basically have to selectively coat around each one. Um, it's achievable but it takes a little more effort to do that. Um, so it, it, it depends on the, the configuration of the board and the, the complexity of how many LEDs and what the layout is in order to accommodate that. Okay. 
Um, now, Camille, I think we've got a couple of examples which uh, uh, we'll get up on the screen shortly, but uh, maybe you can start uh, talking about um, the um, importance of the uh, exposure of the of the, the UV cure uh, for LEDs. So I'll, I'll talk about that as it relates to uh, the curing of the material. So as we mentioned with the two-part uh, materials, you're able to get that chemical reaction to ensure that your material materials are fully and completely cured. Um, when you're curing UV type materials, uh, the proper UV exposure is critical to making sure that your your fluid is completely cured. Um, there are complications with shadowing, so depending on where the material is, if it doesn't get access to those those UV waves, um, then you're still going to have material that relies on a secondary moisture cure, heat cure, a secondary curing mechanism to ensure that that is fully cured. Right. And once you're dealing with UV, you want to have the correct balance of UVA, UVC lighting to make sure that you coat not only the top but the depth as well. Okay. Is, is it true though that um, if you if you overexpose it, that um, you, you could uh, crack the the, uh, the coating or that type of thing? Yes, that's potentially true. Um, mm -hmm. That also comes into effect when you're dealing with coating thickness as well. So if you mm -hmm. put on a layer of material that's too thick when you're curing, if the material tends to shrink, you're going to introduce stresses on the lead joints, things like that. Yeah. So cracking in the coating is not just an imperfection or a defect in the coating itself, giving moisture or whatever um, accessibility, but you're potentially introducing a failure to your board as well. Right, okay. So, Jeff, uh, any input on LED coatings and, yeah, and well, UV exposure? Well, yeah, in terms of selecting for, you know, LED type applications, it gets very customer specific because there's uh, an expanding number of LED designs out there. You know, mm -hmm. you know, if you kind of think back to the traditional through hole, you know, red, green, you know, LEDs <laughs> where we've come a long way very since different. then, you know, yeah. so we've got, you know, surface mount, channel set, all these other equipment uh, or board level, device level configurations for the LED that present challenges not only for the material in terms of coding that uniformly, but also, you know, from an application standpoint, how can we work with the equipment vendor to yeah, code you probably, it reliably? You probably, uh, uh, cure the surface mint ones faster because uh, there is less surface area on them, I'm guessing. Yeah, and you know, it, 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 it also gets very specific with the customer's design because as Hans alluded to, some, some people will allow coating of the lens, other people don't. Uh, but if you do overcoat the lens, many, many end users have very strict requirements in terms of you know, light intensity loss or any type of mm -hmm. wavelength shift for the output of the LED because you know, they're yeah. not just indicator lights anymore. They're high graphic, you know, they're for high graphic systems in a lot of exactly. applications. Yeah. So it's very complicated. Very complicated. Dave, last word to you on uh, the subject of LEDs and uh, UV coating. Yeah, LEDs, again, it really depends on the end user, but um, the, the, the issue a lot of times with putting a, a coating over an LED is, as mentioned, it, it shifts the light, it could shift the output of the light. Um, also, a lot of coatings will yellow over time, which will, will change the output of, your, of, your, right. of, your, of the light too. So when, it, when a customer wants to use a, a conformal coating over an LED, then they need to consider these, these things. And when we recommend materials for, for LED applications, those are things that we need to, to, to make sure of, that the customer is aware of, that certain chemistries will yellow over time, certain chemistries will shift the, the light. Mm -hmm. um, and so the customer would have to compensate for that and realize that. Right. Um, okay. Well, I think that's bringing us to the end of, of uh, today's panel. Uh, I think we've had some great answers, and I want to thank you all for taking part. Uh, to my left, we have Hans Bock from uh, Specialty Coding Systems. Uh, to his right, we have Camille Siebert from Norton Asymtech. Uh, to my right, Jeff Sargent thank from uh, Humaseal. And, of course, on the end, we have Dave Edwards from Henkel. And thank you for joining us today.